the mind is used to wandering around. That's what the word samsara means. It's not a place. It's an activity. It's something you do. And for most of it, it's a matter of going from one desire to another desire, wanting this, and then either you get it, and then you say, okay, enough of that, let's move on to something else. Or if you realize you won't get it, then you move on to something else. It's the mind's on a constant move. Creating what's called bhava literally means becoming or being. It's better, I think, to translate it as becoming because the process is dynamic. It's not like being in a, as a metaphysical absolute. It's being, becoming something, being something, being somewhere. You actually create the where through your focus on a particular de desire, a particular craving. That's something we do all the time. both on the cosmic level as you go from one life to the next, and also on the immediate level as you're sitting here, focusing on one object and losing interest, focusing on something else. And in the focus, you create a world, or you create a very particular experience of the world. There's an allegory that the Buddha tells at one point in the canon of how the cosmos goes through many cycles of expansion and contraction. When it contracts, the beings either go to the very highest heavens, which are not destroyed, or to the very lowest hells, which are not destroyed. And then as the cosmos begins to expand again, and some of the beings in the highest level start coming down. They're born in this world, which at the time is not like the world we know it at the moment, at present. The beings themselves are self-luminous. They glow, and they travel through space, and the world itself is nothing but water. Think about the story of Genesis with God brooding over the waters. But in this case, instead of brooding or creating a world the way God did, they create their own worlds. This film begins to appear on the water, and according to that description, it has the color of really good ghee or really good butter, and the taste of pure wild honey. And one of the beings, simply out of curiosity or just wantonness, wants to check it out. So he takes his finger and he tastes it. And it's so good he immediately sets on it and starts gobbling it down. Then the other beings follow suit. And as they do this, this is where the craving becomes focused on the what they call savory earth, which is this film. And as they gobble the stuff down, they start losing their self-luminosity. They no longer glow. And as soon as they stop glowing, then the moon, <coughs> excuse me, the moon and the sun appear. Days and nights appear, seasons, the passage of years. It gets closer and closer to the world as we know it. You can take the story as an allegory. This is what happens when you focus your craving on something. You change. And the world around you changes. We see this clearly in, with addictions. If you get addicted to a particular drug, all of a sudden everything in the world relates to that drug. As I say, when an alcoholic goes into a house, he pretty quickly scouts out where the alcohol is. Other people walk into the same house and they would never know, because their craving is focused on something else. Then as you get focused on a particular thing, your mind begins to narrow down, especially if it's a, an unskillful kind of craving. So it's through your craving that you create a focus around which you have an experience of the world, you have an experience of yourself. You define yourself through your craving. That's bhava. Now, the thing about the mind is it can move from one bhava to another, one becoming to another. 
It also turns out that if you try to destroy bhava, sometimes we hear about putting an end to further becoming, you think, well, all you have to do is just destroy what you've got. And there's so many ways people do that, either really self-destructive behavior or on subtle levels on the meditation, saying, just don't want to, I'll have no desires, I'll have no wants at all, I'll just accept whatever comes. What happens is they start creating a new self around the one who's just trying to be there still, be there equanimous. And the problem with that kind of self or that kind of bhava is that it's underground. You don't see it. Which is why the Buddha says that through the desire for no becoming is also a cause for further becoming. So he recommends another way out, which is to create a skillful kind of becoming where the process of becoming is transparent. You can see it, how it happens. And that's what we're doing as we meditate as we develop a state of concentration in the mind. You've got that one focus on the breath. And in the beginning you have to have craving. There has to be the craving to do the practice properly. And for the craving to get activated here, you have to make it interesting. This is one of the reasons why we work with the, the breath energy. When you start getting touch, getting in touch with the way the energy moves around your body in relation to the way you breathe, in the relation to your reaction to events around you, it can get really fascinating. So this is why it's important when you meditate is that you don't have too many hard and fast rules about how you're going to explore the energy in the body. You want to follow your interest. Because otherwise the mind's not going to stay. If it feels tied down, it's going to start squirming and it's going to find another focal point for its craving. It'll want to create a different world, but a world that doesn't have the same clarity. So you do what you can to keep the mind here. In some ways you can force it by being strict with it, not allowing it to go wandering off. but. That kind of strict parroting, if it's not tempered with love and not tempered with understanding, is going to create a problem child. So you want to be more understanding. Understand what your mind is interested in right now. What's alluring right now? What aspect of the energy in your body is interesting? Or if you have trouble focusing with the breath, what other themes do you need to think about right now that will help you get more settled down? Sometimes when you're feeling anxious or scattered, it's, it's helpful just to think butto in the mind, but with the in-breath, toe with the mind, without paying too much attention to how the breathing feels. Just give it something to stay with. Or if you're feeling discouraged in the practice, think about other people who've had problems in the practice and yet were able to get through them, come out on the other side. If you're feeling lazy, you can think about death. If you find yourself pulled to lustful thoughts, you can think about what's you, what you've got inside your body and what that other person has inside his or her body. In other words, there are no hard and fast rules for what you should be focusing on right now. Or even if you're focused on the breath, there's no hard and fast rules about where you should focus. This is a common theme in the forest tradition. You know, John Munn didn't have an John Mud, excuse me, a John Munn meditation t technique, and he didn't create a lot of rules about how it had to be done. He would give his students a topic and then send them off, and leave it up to them to figure out how they'd get their minds to settle down around that topic. And with having a lot of time out in the forest, you could experiment. Find out what you found engaging, what find out helped you settle down, whether it was simply the desire to get the mind to 
have some rest and have some peace. Or you have to convince it of the need to settle down by thinking about all the dismaying aspects of being in this process of samsara. Whatever pulled you into the present and helped you to stay there. As long as it worked, it was dharma. So this is what you should bring to the present moment. Some people say, well, you work, practice concentration, try not to have craving, try not to be attached. You've got to have craving, you've got to be attached if you're going to have that focal point where the mind's going to stay and be willing to stay and be happy to stay, to get pleasure out of staying. So try to take an interest in the breath. Give yourself reasons to stay. And when the mind gets bored, we'll give it variations in the breath, variations in your focal point. There are lots of ways you can stay with the breathing. Lots of ways you can conceive the breath process in the body. You know, the things we can learn from Tai Chi or the Chinese teachings on Qi and how it's supposed to flow. And there are other things we should learn on our own, experiment. Whatever you find congenial, whatever you find satisfying. If it helps the mind stay with the body in the present moment, with a sense of well-being, that's dharma. And the more you bring your own ingenuity to the practice, the more it becomes your practice, not some foreign thing that's imposed on the mind. but a way of getting in touch with what's going on in the mind and learning how to nudge it over in skillful directions. So learn to use your ingenuity and use your powers of observation to see what works. Those are probably John Fung's two most common instructions. Be observant, use your ingenuity. Play with the breath, he would say. Not in a lazy, lackadaisical way, but a serious athlete would play a particular sport, wanting to master it, wanting to do it well. Up for the challenges that are presented by trying to learn from what's going on in the body right now, learn from what's going on in the mind right now. This way you create a skillful form of bhava, where the process of becoming becomes transparent. And that's what lays the foundation for you to really see and to cut through the process. So you can get to something beyond.